Previously on the Boogening. Now, Brandon, I noticed that you're still polishing your gun. Oh my goodness, Brandon! Oh, you shot Jake. Oh no! Oh. Ah, no, Jake, why? Ah, it's going dark. Oh. No, Jake. Oh. Ah. Hey, hello! Welcome to the welcome to the bookening. We're uh, I should, I'm I'm Nathan Alberson, whatever your humble, whatever your host. Uh, I'm here with Brandon, Brandon Chastine. You know uh, how you doing, Brandon? I've been better. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I've been better. Uh, Long time listeners of the bookening will know that in our last episode, or the, the third member of our little triumvirate that records these things came to his untimely end. He was shot by Brandon. Yeah. Life is short. Life is short. I'm just trying not to dwell on it too much. Right. Yeah. It's I mean, better. It's better not to dwell on it. Yeah. Brandon shot Jake. My revolver shot Jake. Right. Yeah. Well, people don't kill people. No. Guns kill people. Guns kill people. Right. That's what I've told the authorities. Right. So we just, we're going to talk about Huckleberry Friend today, whatever, but uh, we actually just got back from Jake's funeral. It was very touching. What did yeah. you think about Jake's funeral? Yeah. I was moved. Yeah. How'd that soliloquy go that you read? Something about... To be or not to, to be? To be or not to be. That is the question. That is and the I question. And I mean, he's... He's not. He's not. Right. He's he's answered that question for himself. Right. Definitively. It's it's final. Anyway, we just... We got back from his funeral. It was very nice. It was a good funeral. Good A good send-off for a good man. Very well attended by... A yeah, good turnout. <laughs> he, he did have a good turnout. There was almost like... I mean, all his friends were there. They took up like, what? A, almost an entire row. Oh, um, my... Jake's kids were there. Yep. His family, his friends. The widow Menzel was, was there. there. Her fiance, Steve. He was there. <laughs> you know, I, I really thought that it was just, it was exactly the bagpipe solo that Jake would have wanted. Yeah. That was a great, you know. Yeah, nobody can beat dust in the wind on bagpipes. No, it's no. Just... Not a dry eye in the house. Yeah. Then you got up and you read that, the perfect poem for the occasion, really. I did. You want to tell the people what that poem was? Yeah. Jake, he was our friend. His life came to an end with a bullet from my gun. He was so very young. Yeah. Man, there was not a dry eye. Well, in Jake's honor, let's pull out the old pistols one more time. And I'm a uh, duck. Yeah, I'm trying to try and avoid any ricochet, but let's do con- some contextual Texan for the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I feel like Jake would have wanted us to keep doing it. In fact, he told us he wanted us to keep doing this. Maybe fire off a salute to Jake. Yeehaw. Yeehaw, old buddy. You're yeehawing up in the clouds right now. <laughs> yep. Huckleberry Finn, what do you want to say contextually about that? I wanted to start by just briefly going over Mark Twain's life. Cool. Yeah, so let's get into it. <laughs> All right, so Mark Twain, he was born in Missouri, right by the river. He, Hannibal, Missouri, I think it's a tourist destination now. His whole y- y- childhood was marked by the river, by playing alongside the river, by uh, his father died when he was young. But overall, I, he came from a fairly relatively wealthy family, but he had to go and be an apprentice at a young age to a typesetter, I believe. But also, like we've seen with some of the other authors we've read recently, he um, got into journalism. He started writing some articles and stuff for the local paper that I think may have loosely been associated with the typesetter. This just showed uh, from a young age, he was interested in words and in observation. And he was quickly known for his wry wit. Uh, He had a stint as a steamboat captain. And then after that, he had another even briefer stint as a Confederate soldier for about two weeks. When he got out of that and went up to Nevada, where he um, worked with his brother, who was like the secretary to one of the governors or something up there. Mm -hmm. And he was a miner for a while, but then that failed. And so he just had all these colorful things he had seen. 
around that time, he started writing for another local paper and then wrote his first sh- short story, the one about the jumping frog, which just quickly was loved by critics, loved by his readers, and got him f- fame. And he became a famous writer. And so um, I think that somebody he knew paid for a trip to Europe, and he went and he saw Europe. And around that time, his friend showed him a picture of his sister, and he said that he was going to marry her. And then he went back, courted her, and eventually married her. Yeah, in eighteen the 1860s, and he actually then moved to the New England states, where he became a part of this culture, this sort of the socially progressive academic culture. Harriet Beecher Stowe was their neighbor, which is interesting. That is interesting. Um, and he, he lived and he wrote in this time where literature was really changing quite a bit. But he, So he was a part of this progressive movement like Hemingway was, all these other writers we've been reading. He wrote Hook Finn in 1884. There was this farm that he would go to. I have it written down here somewhere. Oh, the Quarry Farm, where he wrote almost all his great works. And at first, he originally conceived of it as a sequel to Tom Sawyer. But over the next two years, it rapidly changed. In fact, in T.S. Eliot's introduction, he said that Huck Finn, the first two chapters, it's one of those novels that you realize the author had no clue what it was going to be at first. Mm -hmm. And then it just became something completely different. And I think that's partly true. Tom Sawyer just disappears as soon as Huck Finn's father appears and steals him away. And then it becomes great. I mean, the middle is... Fantastic. By this time, he had already also written a lot of his great short stories, the Jumping Frog story, all these things that have made him become famous and, and known as a professional humorist. I think Twain is probably the first in this line that was this character in American literature, I think, that was Garrison Keillor is one of them. What's the other guy? Sedaris? He's, he's almost the American version of a public intellectual. Where it's this guy who's cynical and witty, presidents wanted to be around him, European dignitaries wanted to be around him, and he was just known for his wit and his charm and his great writing. I find that interesting. He's kind of the first one of these figures. But he did like the lectures. Didn't most of his money, once he lost his fortune in that typewriter thing, (laughs) didn't he have to do like just the the lecture circuit for pretty much the rest of his life? Yeah. He made some really dumb investment, like in a typewriter that he invented or something like that. Yeah, it it was really complicated. It was a disaster. He was setter typesetting thing or something. I don't know. He was very interested in science and technology (laughs) because he made a, a lot of money on Tom Sawyer. Right. And he was he was rich. He was going to England, meeting all these famous people. Then he wrote Huck Finn, and it sold. And the other thing about Huck Finn to mention is it was one of the first major censoring cases for an American novel. People thought it was coarse. And he said, well, it was never meant to be read by children. It was written for adults. Mm-hmm. That's what Tom's. Yeah, that's what Mark Twain said. I keep calling him Tom Sawyer. <laughs> um, there was the famous library case. I think it was con- in Concord. Oh, yeah, the Concord. Where they, yeah. And then he told his editor, well, hey, they just they, they censored our book. Now we're going to sell 25,000 more copies. So he said it's good news. <laughs> Did he write them a letter thanking them for yeah, the great so. advertisement? Yeah, and, I the, found it pretty and funny the other letter. thing that he, the other famous piece of wit referring to this is when he said that, yes, he, he believes that young people should be protected from bad literature. That's why he wished someone had kept him from, from reading the, Bible, the whole Bible yeah. when he was young. Mm-hmm. Because there's no more coarse piece of literature or something like that. So. That is Mark Twain for you. Cynical, despised religion, and loved science, loved technology. But to take a step back, where he was in the history of the novel, I find this fascinating. The 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s in literature, this is like the high mark of novel. Before then, you had had the queen, who we've already read, Jane Austen. But then after her, you had this romanticism spell, where poetry was kind of king for a long time. So you had Wordsworth, you had Coleridge, you had Keats, and you had Byron, all these great romantic poets. And the literature you get there with the novel is kind of sappy and weird. So you get Wuthering Heights. Jane Eyre is pretty good. I probably shouldn't pass judgment on Jane Eyre like that. Jane Eyre is fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) But you get all these gothic emotional novels. And then in the 50s, things just take off. You have Dickens, you have uh, Flaubert, you have... Uh, Melville, you have Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, you have Hawthorne still writing, you have some of the great poets still writing, but you have Thoreau, then you get to the 60s, you have George Eliot, you have Turgenev, you have Victor Hugo, you have Dostoevsky, you have Verne, right? You have uh, Lewis Carroll in the 70s and 80s, you have Hardy and Tolstoy and Zola and Henry James and Robert Louis Stevenson. So it's like the high mark of the novel. 
And you have all these different forms coming out, all these different storytelling types. So just like you have the Scarlet Letter in the 50s, you have Madame Bovary, you have Moby Dick in the 50s, you have Bleak House, Anna Karenina, Middlemarch, all these things that really changed and like were genre defining. Like I don't know if you knew Bleak House was the first real like where it, a detective was one of the main characters in the novel, which would lay the groundwork for Conan Doyle. Middlemarch is like the high mark of realist writing. You have Crime and, crime and Punishment, you have War and Peace. You have Das Kapital. So the world is changing. Literature is changing. And then you have Mark Twain, who really does do something very different with Huck Finn in the sense that for the first time, you have someone write a story which is completely believable from the perspective of a, a, like a local dialect. Everything else had kind of been the author, and you could see the author in there. But with Huck Finn, you really believe that Huck Finn is telling you the story. So you had had that to an extent, like David Copperfield, but it's written from the perspective of someone who would speak like Dickens. With Huck Finn, it was a piece that was written with a particular dialect in mind. And this, it was kind of groundbreaking for the time. And so that's one of the reasons stylistically that Huck Finn is seen as this high mark of American literature and often seen as the great American novel when people have those corny debates. Like, what's the great American novel? But another thing that you had as literature was slow, swiftly changing is you have these issues dealing with form. What is the novel going to be? How should it be shaped? What story does it tell? And so you have Dickens with his big sprawling novels. You have Tolstoy with his essays that just randomly appear in the middle of his novels. Dostoevsky playing with psychology. You have George Eliot playing with just high realism. Uh, oh, the other one I forgot is Henry James was also writing in this period, right? And he's kind of, for the snobs, he's seen as the great American writer. Portrait of a Lady, I think, was written in the 70s, right before Tom Sawyer. You also have the socially aware novels that were written, like Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so what this means is that all the style and all the form, it was up in the air, it was up for debate. And one of the failures people see with Huck Finn is the ending. Right. So he had this great story he was telling, and then he either you have the argument that he chickened out or that he just that's the argument that a lot of modern critics would say is he just chickened out and couldn't make his big point about racism and race relations or that it was just a failure of imagination that he didn't know what to do with the ending with Huck. And so he brought Tom Sawyer back in to save the day. The one who actually does defend it is T.S. Eliot. He says that it's the place the novel should end. You have this world that had to be brought full circle because it's a comedy. And it's the king of that world is Tom Sawyer. So he had to come back and save the day and bring things back to normal. Hmm. So, is that Christian T.S. Eliot or a pre-Christian T.S. Eliot? That I don't actually know. It's a good question. Huh. But yeah, so T.S. Eliot is definitely on the side of people should stop whining about the ending. Hemingway thought that you should stop reading before the ending. <laughs> and he said it was like the, the novel from which all American literature sprang forth or something. And yeah. you should read the last third. I mean, William Faulkner called uh, Mark Twain the father of American literature. All these great writers who would come in the 20th century would. So, oh, one of the other things is just interesting is that, I don't know, I like the middle of the 19th century. Mm-hmm. It's, it's when you see, like with Shakespeare with theater, you see the growth of something new. In the middle of the 19th century, you see the growth of something new, and that's all these different novel forms. Whatever you think of Jules Verne, I mean, he created science fiction in this period, too. It's just right. fascinating to see all these things. Lewis Carroll with this, with Alice in Wonderland and all these rich creations coming out. It's just, it's really cool. And uh, then Mark Twain fits in there nicely. I wonder if you couldn't put every genre back, like all the major genre science fiction that's interesting. I think you probably can trace it back to somewhere in that period. All the all the ghost stories because even arguably stuff like then um, postmodernism with mm-hmm. all whatever it thinks it's doing really cool with the author and the text and all that stupid stuff that it's trying to do like David Foster Wallace his mm-hmm. stuff it was done with Moby Dick sure it was just done without the irony you know he wasn't sipping on a PBR and laughing at his characters that's the only difference so if you think that the creation of irony is something that's groundbreaking then you know go and sit in a greasy corner with your hipster friends but hey it was all done much better <laughs> bow boom shot over the bow of you both modern lovers without any reason <laughs> except that you guys are awful <laughs> that was a good reason 
Well, Brandon, uh, I guess we need to get on with the show. It's, uh, it's a little hard, though, you know. Uh, yeah. I feel like there's an empty corner over there. Because there is, right. I guess. <laughs> yeah. The corner that used to be occupied by Jake. Yeah. I sure do miss that guy. I do, too. His insights. His... his his wisdom his yeah. uh, he was the pastor who was a master he was the pastor of who was everything a master of everything including books <sighs> but not being shot no he well he was the master i mean well, he, yeah. he, he got shot and died about his if, if if that was his goal then he mastered it he mastered it yeah well i guess uh i guess there's nothing for it but what's that sound oh it's the sound of the the, the airplane going over indicating baggage check but do you see that? What is that? There's some, some weird... What the? <laughs> what is... Someone jumped it's, out of the airplane. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting closer. I can't really make it out. If there's this, this podcast has a glass ceiling, by the way, for our listeners. And for all the women out there. For the, for the... <laughs> and in fact, just like the women are probably hoping, someone's breaking that glass ceiling. <laughs> Watch out for the glass, Brandon. Oh, no. <laughs> and a rope ladder's coming down. Who is, who is that mysterious masked figure? Speak, apparition. It is I, Jake Mensel, breaker of glass ceilings. <laughs> Jake Mensel. My goodness. <laughs> Jake, we thought you were dead. Reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. But I saw Brandon shoot you and you died and... We I dead. rigged his gun. I rigged it with chewing gum. I had fake blood. I faked my death. Yes. Chewing gum, of course. Of course. Why didn't we think of that, Brandon? That's why it was so sticky. Right. <laughs> I knew I couldn't get it clean. It's all coming together. It's all coming together now. So you faked your own death. I did. And what, what purpose, pray tell? First, I had to fly to England. Okay. And I had to find Jane Austen's grave. Okay. And I had to dig up her body. Oh. And then okay. I had to steal her shin bone. Okay. Well, that should have gone without saying. And then I went on a secret hunt for one Samuel Clemens. I didn't know it was Samuel Clemens at first. First, I was looking for a guy named Mark Twain, but then I found that no such person actually existed. Yeah. But there was actually a guy named Samuel Clemens who wrote as Mark Twain. And what was your vendetta against this Twain? I had to bash him over the head with Jane Austen's shin bone. Why? Because he insulted Jane Austen. That dirty rat. That Did you get coward. Him? No, I've... I spent years, it 37 has, years, 30, has, yeah. 37 years hunting for him through That's a long time, the, yeah. along, all along the Mississippi River, from Missouri down to New oh, Orleans. That might. Surely Clemens would have revealed himself by now, Brandon. Don't you? Well, it could be he's, he died in, in the early 1900s. So he was, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> if you built a time machine, maybe. Uh-huh. <laughs> But it sounds like, I mean, by that, he's just been 37 years more dead. Right. So if your plan was to, if your plan was to stick it to old Mark Twain, then I guess he's 37 years more dead. So success in his face. <laughs> but uh, it's been a sad 37 years. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I, um, I just thought, you know. But we didn't talk. Why didn't you tell us your plan? Why did Brandon's been so guilty? He almost went to jail for for shooting him. Yeah, almost. <laughs> there are police looking it. for Brandon right now. I yeah. successfully hit on an island in the middle of Monroe Lake. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to pull off uh, a plan like bashing Mark Twain over the head with Jane Austen's shin bone was to do it with style, the way that Tom Sawyer would. So oh, yeah. that's what I had to do. Right. There was no other possible way to do it. You took a page out of Clemens' own book That's right. to get Clemens. It was going to be poetic justice at its height. It all makes sense. Well, Jake, I I think we're glad to have you back. Very glad. I'm relieved. Right. I can come out of hiding now. <laughs> right. Your wife and kids will be happy and... Well, maybe. <laughs> it has been 37 <laughs> years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> your wife and kids... Uh, uh, I wish you, they'll be happy. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll be glad to see me. You know, it might be a little awkward with Steve. <laughs> Who's Steve? <laughs> well, anyway, we were we were actually just talking about Samuel Clemens. We were we were talking about his immortal classic, Huck Finn. Is that right? Yeah, we were just about to give our baggage. Well, I have some of that. Okay, yeah, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> you probably have the most baggage of anyone. <laughs> uh, Forty years worth of it, at least. <laughs> So let's talk about our baggage for uh, that we bring to this. Um, Brandon, what baggage did you bring to oh, Mark, Mark Twain's Huck Finn? <laughs> well, we know what baggage. What baggage? We know what baggage 
Jake, <laughs> Jake brought to it. You talked about it in the other episode of the fine episode of the book thing that people should listen to about our favorite books. Oh, that's right. You want to give us a quick recap of that? Yeah, I guess the baggage that I brought was as much associations I had back to the time of life that I read Twain, which was somewhere between 10 and 11 years old, mm-hmm. where uh, Twain was a voice for my own inner uh, cynic it, or gave voice maybe is the best way to put it to my own, own inner cynic. One of, the, one of the things that I didn't realize in going back and rereading Huck Finn was how much of an escape it actually was for me. Because I actually grew up on the Ohio, Ohio River in Evansville, Indiana, right mm-hmm. right on a river town. And so that that sort of played into how I, how I read Huck Finn and my fantasies about just getting on a raft mm-hmm. and sailing down the river. So there, there was that whole other element to it that I, I wasn't remembering um, only just sort of associating, you know, some of the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah, it's a well. We'll talk more about that. But what a what a book to escape to. And then obviously you brought thirty seven years of trying to hunt down Mark Twain to to murder him. Yeah, but then well, you know, just beat him over the beat head. him over the head with yeah. the shin bone. I, w- yeah. I wasn't going to murder him. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I'm hit sorry. Him in the head. Yeah. And what uh, baggage did you bring to this book, Brandon? Weirdly enough, my first experience with Mark Twain, I think, was in a Star Trek episode. <laughs> <laughs> like he was a holotech character. Yeah, or he, was, like he was somehow a character. I vaguely remember this. Do none of you remember this? <laughs> I have an image in my head. And he of, was witty. He was always yeah. smoking that cigar. Even though I think in real life he smoked a pipe all the time. It was constantly a pipe because he wasn't a. He was uh, forced to go and write in the side home in that farm. I'm remembering because they didn't want the pipe smoke in the house. I don't know why that matters, but <laughs> in the Star Trek episode, or no, in, no, in, in, in real life, life yeah, okay. but yeah. So he was witty and funny, and then I read Huck Finn eventually and loved it. I thought it was as a kid or as an adult. Yeah, as a man, probably around twelve. Okay, thought it was great at that point. You know, you're wanting to go out and be in the woods and run around and have fun. We lived in a place where that was kind of possible. There was a creek and stuff, and so none of the real racial stuff came out for me then then i'd never really read any other mark twain so he didn't do it enough for me that i went and read like tom sawyer i've never read tom sawyer really actually yeah i probably should probably yeah it's probably a book i could read to the kids maybe i don't know yeah i think you probably could right yeah i think so, so. he said it was written for adults so i think he's wrong i think, I think tom was, sawyer's oh i think it was probably also being sarcastic but they're both books for boys yeah right. they were <clears> perfect <throat> for you know i read them back to back at, right at that age of 10 to 12 and they were yeah. just Right in the sweet spot, I thought, or I think now looking back on it. And I think that uh, my the rest of my history with Mark Twain is just seeing him as not quite the level to which I wanted to read. So he was under like Moby Dick and he was under the Russian writers. Mm-hmm. And so then to my surprise, what should appear <laughs> in grad school? The first book that I was assigned in my American literature course was Huck Finn. Had a good long discussion about it. That's where I, I realized how many people hated him because of how many times he uses the N-word. Mm-hmm. And they and there was a lot of debate and tension about whether or not he was racially sensitive or racially insensitive. and But more of a, a, more of a clinical approach towards him. But actually, when we read it, I liked the book a lot. I, I forgot how just good of a storyteller he was. And so I know the baggage, I can tell you. So I don't have a lot of that weight, that baggage that a lot of the other academics would have. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that a lot of them have baggage towards him because there's a love-hate relationship with him, a lot like with Hemingway. They think Jim is both great and awful. And the ending, they don't so much hate the ending for artistic failures, but because what Tom Sawyer does to Jim just seems to be... Um, whitewashed. Yeah. I mean, what he does to Jim is pretty awful. I, I might agree. I was, gonna, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking. Yeah. But whether or not Mark Twain. Yeah, that's what's bothersome yeah. about it. But we'll get into that later. Okay. So that's, yeah, so that's my baggage. My baggage is uh, I read Huck. Or, uh, bleh, we're going to probably make this confusion the whole time. I read Tom Sawyer at about the age Jake is talking about. Or maybe even had it read to me. I don't remember. But I really enjoyed it just as a boy's story. And I remember at the time being really struck by how the adult world and the children's world intersected in Mark Twain. That's of course not how I would have put it, but the fact that, uh, engine Joe ends up dying the way that he does in Tom Sawyer was bothersome. The fact that there was real kind of adult stakes, there was death, there was all this stuff in the book, even in some, even a relatively compared to Huck Finn, simple book like Tom Sawyer, there was still this 
scary adult world, which I remember being very striking to me. But but you know, I was I was charmed by it and loved it. And then I never really read Twain and never had to read Huck Finn for school. I don't know why. Somehow I missed Huck Finn until I was in my early twenties. And I tried to read it a couple of times, but I was actually always defeated by the dialect. I don't know if I was just being lazy or what, because the dialect did not seem like that big of a hurdle this time. But I've always hated phonetic dialect and uh, resented having to slow down and say it out loud or or read it. I've, I've just never enjoyed the old books that use phonetic dialect, like specifically the way Jim talks. I don't so much mind, you know, the way that Huck talks or anybody or some of the other characters, but specifically Jim was always difficult for me when I was high school age. But then in the twenties, I saw in my twenties, I solved that problem by listening to the book. I listened to a really fantastic audio book mm-hmm. recording, a guy that did all the different voices and, you know, did it just like I'm sure Mark Twain would want you to do it with uh, just a real warm kind of storytellers gusto doing all the characters, you know, giving, Jim and the women and all the different characters, bringing them to life. And that was a good way to get into it. And I loved it. I've always liked Mark Twain. I've never had a problem with Mark Twain. I'm shrugging nonchalantly, listeners. This is a really great book to listen to on tape. It is. I was listening to it, and it does really well that way. It's like it was meant to be spoken. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, there are parts of it that I found myself reading aloud or... Or even in reading it this time, there are parts of it that I missed the experience of having it read aloud or that mm-hmm. I wanted to slow down and kind of savor the way that it sounded. It's, it is a book for that has an, I don't know what you would say, an oral or auditory, auditory. pleasure yeah, to it. it. That some great books, even some great writing, even something like Hemingway, which is great writing, it's to be read. This book, maybe 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 the best way to experience this book is to listen to it. Yeah, he, f- he fits into that more storytelling model, like we were saying with Steinbeck, where you can imagine this being spoken to you. I think authors usually either fit into that where you, because Twain was famous for being a witty conversationalist, mm-hmm. and you can see that here. You could just listen to him for hours, where you get the impression that Dostoevsky would not have been fun to hang out with at a party. <laughs> no. <laughs> so... Well, uh, let's let's dive into the book. The way I thought we'd tackle this is we'd talk a little bit just about Huck as a character first, and then I want to talk about some of the some of the issues surrounding the book, some of the some of the some of the baggage that the book has, and then I thought we'd just trace Huck's journey and talk about the different episodes and uh, kind of kind of go on a little journey with Huck Finn and just follow him and comment on the different things that happen. But first, uh, more generically speaking, just about Huck Finn. I don't know. Maybe I'll start by opening up the floor. What would you guys say about Huckleberry Finn as a character? Did you like him? What did you think about him? How would you sum him up? Big, broad question. Answer it any way you want. Yeah, I don't know how you can not like Huck. He's just a lovable kid. I think Twain goes out of his way to make him lovable. Everything from his backstory, you know, you have pity on him at first, but then you you experience the whole story through his eyes. And he's a sweet, good-natured kid who is also real and conflicted and just very easy to relate to, I think. Yeah. I, one of the best ways for me to think through him as a character is in relationship to the other characters. And it's like in comparison to Tom Sawyer, I think in Tom Sawyer and a lot of the way that you, I don't know from the story of Tom Sawyer, but he's the hero of that book. Right. Yeah. And he's the, he's the leader. He has the imagination. But one of the points that T.S. Eliot made about Huck Finn is that he's the one who has vision he doesn't just – he sees the world as it is, and he – you it's very easy to sympathize with him. He doesn't quite right. n- know he sees the world as it is. Yeah, that's that's right. He just – he observes the world. He sees it, and that allows him to pass true judgments on things. Mm-hmm. And so he – there's that great scene where he's floating out to those guys, and he's having the conflict about whether or not he's going to turn in Jim, mm-hmm. right? And then he his mouth sticks, and he can't say, and then he says it's a white man on the boat. Just the internal conflict there that Twain manages to give to Huck is fantastic. It's moving. And then the other scene that is very revealing with Huck is um, where he tricks Jim. And then Jim, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. I mean, man, that almost moved me to tears. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a good you know, scene. It's a great scene. Mm-hmm. And where he realizes that uh, he would never do that again. Mm-hmm. And so you see his, to go back to one of the early words we used, it is a buildings roman mm-hmm. to an extent. But I think you see growth in Huck. 
Yes. But well, we'll get to that. But I would I would argue that at the end of the novel, despite Tom coming in and being an entitled brat and ruining the end of the <laughs> novel, I think there is still growth in Huck. Yeah, two points there. Well, we're, I guess we're going to talk about it later. But one essay that that I did read said that psychologically, this book is the ending makes sense because Huck is a young boy, mm-hmm. right? We expect too much of Huck if we expect the ending to be this big, um, epic thing where he saves Jim, mm-hmm. right? He was just a boy, mm-hmm. and he this was a journey where he never does much to act as the hero, and yet just because who he is, he is the hero, right? Yeah, and if Huck is, um, and we'll talk more about that when we get yeah. into the ending, but I think part of Huck's charm comes from the fact that he is, in some sense, a passive character, you know, all mm-hmm. these adult characters are always kind of getting him into these situations. And then he just kind of has the right observation or does the right small thing within just being jerked around in this this crazy world that he's found himself in. It, it, it reminded me of, I don't know what the word for this kind of, I don't know if there's like a literary term for this kind of a character, but it made me think of characters like Forrest Gump. I guess Forrest Gump would be the big modern character. You know, Forrest Gump is a guy that doesn't really do anything right except for just be decent and passively kind of history, yeah. society, culture happens to him. And Forrest Gump just keeps his head above water by being more innocent and more wise than the people around him. And that's the kind of – and almost wise through his naivete, which is how Huck is. The difference uh, between Forrest Gump and, and Huck is that Huck is – is believable in that when you have a dad like Huck had, that is how you survive. Mm-hmm. That is how you you learn how to how to slip between the cracks and how to nuance things and how to you know just find a way to exist and protect yourself. So there's a there's a reality to Huck being yeah. the kind of character that can get in and out of those scrapes that yeah we i think we all know kids like that and you know they'll they'll kind of keep their eyes down they won't make eye contact they'll they'll know when to slip into a corner and kind mm-hmm. of not be when to disappear when, to, when disappear. to hide under the bed when to go for a walk in the woods mm-hmm. when to and that stuff is all second nature to huck and yeah you're right i hadn't thought about that but that's a good point it uh it's very believable the way that he uh, he allows himself to be be adapted or he adapts into these different situations, including with the, the Granger Fords and all the different things where it's like, why don't you just run away? It actually makes a lot of sense that he would. He's an abused kid. Mm-hmm. That's what yeah. they do. Did you find his innocence to be believable? As Christians that believe in original sin, Pastor Menzel, should we believe that Huck Finn can be this kind of innocent naive or sh- should he in fact be more bitter and twisted by his circumstances? Not, I find him completely believable. Yeah, asked and answered. What about Huck as a comedic character? Does somebody want to take a stab at, like, where does the comedy of the book come from, and how is it expressed through Huck Finn? Well, a lot of the comedy comes from, well, some of the comedy at least comes from just funny observations of a young boy who doesn't completely understand the world yet. Some of the humor is directed at, like, prayer, Mm -hmm. right? Him trying to figure out the nature of prayer and why these people who are, what is it, his aunt... What's well, Mrs. What are the two Not his aunt. Mrs. Watson. Mrs. It's Watson. The sister of this, the widow that the widow right. yeah. took him in. Then there's that great scene where they're talking about the French language. And so a lot of it is comes out of their simplicity and uh, Jim's simplicity, which right. a lot of people, that bugs them. Um, yeah, it reminded me a lot of the comedy of, I don't know what a specific example is, but you'll, you'll hear comedians do routines about things like, what if an alien came down? to earth and you know they saw how we treated our dogs they would think the dogs were in charge you know the comedy of an outsider who doesn't quite get yep. it oh it's like that movie probably neither one of you guys ever saw the movie you ever see the movie star man with jeff bridges nope <laughs> so in star man jeff bridges plays an alien you know who comes to earth has to adapt himself and figure out how humans interact and there's a famous scene from the movie where he's driving he's just learned to drive and he, he ends up almost causing a terrible wreck and is the girl is yelling at him and everything and he says you know i have observed your ways i've learned how it works green means go, red means stop and yellow means drive faster and it's that comedy it's the comedy of someone accurately observing how we actually act because they don't have the capacity to give it the societal nuance that we all naturally give it so they cut they cut through it that's what Huck does by being innocent. He's able to cut past all the lies that 
we tell ourselves about everything from religion to race to that's right yeah family and just see it for how it is because he doesn't know any better yeah one of the clearest places of that is when he goes to the is it the grangersons granger fords I granger think, fords or, house and their daughter with the pictures that she was drawing yes. and the idol mm-hmm. that she is to that family he also loves these drawings but just the way that he presents them to us is really funny mm-hmm. right it shows sort of the ridiculousness of this emo gothic girl mm-hmm. and huck is actually he's pretty funny yeah he makes funny wry observations where he says that <laughs> the only one who i can't remember how he put it but basically the only one who had it good at the funeral was the dead guy right because he was the only one who didn't have to be bored right <laughs> So that was yeah. pretty funny. <laughs> did you ever feel like Twain's sort of wry observational wit got in the way, or did you ever feel Twain peeking out? Did you ever? I didn't actually, but did no, you? No, I just feel, feel like Huck, uh, Huck was a perfect vessel for everything yeah. he wanted to say. So you never kind of got natural. the feeling of oh, this is Mark Twain just wanted to get his little observation in here, so you know Huck would never actually say. That. I mean, if you step I've back, heard, and, I've heard if, people criticize it that way. If so you step back and look at the plot and look at the setups and you know, the scenes, the situations he puts Huck into, but it's, it all comes off natural for Huck, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Uh, that funeral scene's a fantastic example of, yeah. you know, I'm sure Mark Twain had a lifetime of observations about stupid funerals and obsequious undertakers and everything like that. Whatever that guy was, the funeral guy, that was funny. Yeah, with Huck, I feel that, well, the observation that he's both Huck and Tom, I think is good. That Mark Twain is, yeah. Because yeah. I think that he probably grew up a lot like Tom Sawyer, mm-hmm. but also had a lot of Huck Finn in him as well. And that Huck, just by being who he is, would be a little bit naturally defensive too and be witty and wry and cynical, but also innocent. I don't know how those all merge together. Mm-hmm. Maybe as he grows older, he becomes more of the one than the other. But I find myself not really wanting to think about Huck ever changing yeah. or growing up. Uh, I like the fact that he's in a book, and I like the, where the book ends, and I don't ever want to read Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer Go to Space or whatever the sequel was that Mark Twain wrote. There are no clue there are two this. more books about to- Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn that Mark Twain wrote, and they're not no popular kidding. at all. Yeah, I had no clue. They're, they're, they're not supposed to be very good. Um, if one they of go to called, space, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> they don't go to space. I think in one of them they get on a balloon, and the balloon gets blown to – England or something or, or Europe and they have all these crazy fantastic kind of Jules Vernean adventures and it's just like supposed to be really silly and then the other huh. one the, the, other, the other one is called Tom Sawyer Detective and it's a parody of the detective novels of the time and it's both of them are narrated by Huck so I don't know it'd be kind of fun maybe on like season you know 50 of the book and we'll have to tackle one of those when we're that totally out fun, of ideas but I imagine it just goes back to where the, the failures of this book, where yeah, I think Tom so. takes over and Huck disappears. Mm-hmm. I think that Mark yeah. Twain failed to realize who was the more interesting character, or at least who deserved to be the ultimate hero. Well, I like what you're saying about them both being part of Mark Twain's personality, because that gives me a way of understanding why Mark Twain cuts Tom so much slack. Yeah. Because to me, Tom is just as much of a monster as any of the monsters in this book. But Tom, Mark Twain seems to like it like him more than a lot of the other monsters in the book, which is weird. Well, that is a, that is something to say about Huck, is he finds sympathy for almost everyone, mm-hmm. right? Even at the end when he sees the Duke and the King tarred and feathered. Yeah, he had much more sympathy than I did in he that had, moment. Yeah, he said he couldn't hold a grudge against these two guys or something, right? People sure he, can be cruel. Yeah. And so these guys who had sold Jim and made his life so horrible, he finds a way to um, understand them, which is... He never wanted to see them come to harm. He just yeah. wanted to escape them. He wasn't going to sell them out. And I think it has to do with his childhood, his father. That yeah. is interesting. Though that, that gets... I don't know if it's short-shifted or not, but when Jim tells him that it was his father that he had seen, man, that's that's a beautiful scene. When you realize that's what he was protecting to mm-hmm. Huck from seeing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just as a um, quick aside, he has this beautiful... Twain has this beautiful ability to give um, Jim humanity. Mm-hmm. Like there. Without ever seeming to, just just in the periphery. Yeah, that, like, yeah. that was really detail. smart to save that for the yeah. very yeah. end, too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I remember that, and I kept waiting for it. Finally realized that that was going to come at the very end. 
the Elijah Woods movie ruins that. They make it. He did it so that Huck wouldn't go home. Oh, because he just needed to escape or whatever. Yeah, he would realize his father was dead. Well, that's just that's just that's lame. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I thought we were going to have to spend a lot more time on my question to Jake about whether a uh, Huck Finn could actually exist, but uh, Jake obviously didn't want to spend any time on it, and I don't either. And the reason is, I do believe Huck, and I don't know why. It's just like I have known sweet thirteen-year-old kids. Now, to be fair, a lot of them end up being bitter, nasty, not kids. It's not. I don't know that this innocence like this lasts, but as far as capturing a moment in a in a person's development, I can believe it. Maybe my quickness to embrace this, because when I read the book, reading it again, I remembered how much I felt like Huck. Mm-hmm. Me too. Um, as a you know, as a boy, the age mm-hmm. of Huck, reading Huck, feeling like I was always caught between people. Yeah, and trying some way to slip through the cracks, finding my ways to hide, which is why. Getting on a raft and going down the Ohio River and meeting the Mississippi was such a big fantasy for me. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. And I am thinking of a couple kids I know that had that sweetness and kept it. So, I mean, by God's grace, it does happen. I don't know why or how. Because if you were just going to try and make like a theological argument for Huck, I don't know exactly how you'd do it. Besides just... As to what he would become? Or just like, how does someone, how does someone maintain that much innocence in the face of that much well, i think you said it by god's grace yeah so a lot of the representations are uh, the way that he's presented mm-hmm. i think people for some reason that people it seems like people don't really understand huck finn they play up his rambunctiousness and his his tom sawyerish quality. yeah his tom sawyerish and he's not that way at all when you read huck finn you're like who's this character that everyone tries to make huck finn out to be and so he's the rapscallion, and you always see him kind of with his wry grin, smoking his pipe, and these pictures. Stealing pies off of windows. Yeah, and, and it's stuff. just that's that's absolutely not the character who's in this book. No, mm-hmm. even when he like when him and Jim are borrowing things from people, they have to work out this complicated like moral. <laughs> just yeah, that's what, I, that's what can, I was thinking. Yeah, maybe they can justify it somehow. We won't yeah. steal these things, right? We'll only borrow these certain things here. So right. it's some sort of law that somehow makes sense, and right. Jim and he are okay with it. They give up the things that they don't, don't want. Like. Yeah, which, <laughs> that's which right. Fun. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, yeah. He's just an innocent observer, mm-hmm. and that makes his judgments even more true about people. But how do you guys feel about the very Mark Twainian inversion of morality? You know, the way that Mark, that Huck says, "When you're cornered, of course you tell a lie." But this one, I was finally backed up into a corner, and I had to tell the truth. You know, and I like—I mean, I find it absolutely charming. But I don't know whether that makes me a bad person. You know, the whole well, the, the yeah. whole thing of Huck just always saying the opposite of the moral thing, mm-hmm. being truly moral, where he decides that telling the truth and telling the lie really depends on the situation. What's right, more, and then the, I guess the famous one for us. Would be where he decides that he'll go to hell. Yeah, we'll we'll talk more about that later, of course. Okay. But um, I mean, just in general, do you have any thoughts about? I mean, is Huck like if if, if for for your your kid's going to be ten before you know it, Jake? Will you have any hesitation about him reading this book or about him learning the wrong lessons from it? I don't think so. Actually, I I don't think he'll learn the the wrong lessons from it. I'm happy for him to read it. I think it's a great boys' book. I'd want him to read Tom then Huck, mm-hmm. and I just wanted talk with him about it sure went through it but yeah maybe dumb kids would get the wrong lessons but <laughs> not my kids right not kids. <laughs> dumb kids are gonna be reading right <laughs> yeah that's true they'll, they'll just be playing maybe i just have a real soft spot for for these books actually well uh, there's something to that uh, i mean um to the soft spot to the soft sp- i mean it's like i mean you know i've said a lot of things nasty about twain and about these books in the past over the course of this show. And that's because, you know, I really do see those are just formative years, 10 to 12. You're beginning to figure out who you are. And so there was, there was Twain to offer somebody for me to be or a way to recognize who I was. And I latched onto that. And I, and I, I look back over a lot of the, the cynicism, the nastiness that I grew into. And I, I, I do trace a lot of it back to, to Twain, but at the same time, I don't know. I love Huck. I do too. I have a real soft spot for him. I I'd, I would. Really, I found myself almost. I mean, don't take this the wrong way. Don't take it. You don't have to. It's not a personal thing against you. But I was thinking back through the different episodes of the Bookening where you've had things to say, like about Mark Twain and him being cynical, and I found myself wondering whether I 
liked that representation or was glad that that's what we'd put in the bookening so far because I was like, this book's great. And I knew what you meant. And, you know, I'm not sorry that we said what we said in those other episodes. I do think it's true. I think he's cynical. I think he hates everybody. Um, But just the same. I love Huck, and I think he does too. Yeah. Yeah, he was was the pessimist. He was known as this wry, pessimistic humorist. But for some reason, it doesn't come across as strongly in Huck Finn because I think he loves Huck, like you said, and he loves Jim. And what he is pessimistic towards, where all these cynics usually end up, is they just hate... They hate religion, they hate society, they hate all these things because all they see is the hypocrisy. And so you can see the seeds of that in Huck. He sees the hypocrisy. And that's why he ends up at these conclusions like, okay, well, I'll just go to hell. Or, may you know, just praying must just work for these people who are already good people. Right, and I'm not a good person. And so he's been if I told— I thought it would do any good for Mary, Mary's yeah. a really interesting character mm-hmm. that I hope we'll talk about. There we will. Yeah. If he, says, he says, if I thought it would do any good for her, I might actually do it. Yeah. yeah. But there again, you see this kind of abused kid mentality of, well, you know, of course God doesn't love me. But, yeah, he's bought into it. You know. People have told him. And, but, I mean, I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've struggled with that my whole life. And, yep. you know, it's very believable. It's not— yep. I'm not—yeah, I'm not saying— it's off. It's. I'm not saying it's unreal or unrealistic that he would buy into it. Right. I, but I think that's why the ending makes sense is because it's the it's Huck has his chance and his chance is while he's on the river and as soon as he gets pulled back out, all the outside forces come back to work yeah. on him and he sort of shrinks back. And that's not to say he hasn't grown, but it is to say that there's not much. What can you do with a in a world that's so that's going to put so much pressure on mm-hmm. on Huck from all sides. Right. At the end of the day, Mark Twain obviously doesn't believe in clear moral victories, and he doesn't give Huck one. And that There's is, no redemption. There's no redemption. But I what did find myself surprised in reading the book by, you know, how clearly a good sense of morality came through, you know, how, how much you felt. I mean, how much you felt Twain as, you felt Twain's cynicism, but you also felt like you do with all cynics that, you know, a cynic is just a frustrated, frustrated idealist. idealist and yeah. that was Twain to a T. And, and you saw, you know, in, in Twain's later letters and his autobiography and some of the things near the end of his life, it just feels like he's, it's really curdled and, nasty and um yep. you know i just I, I don't like that man but he, i don't know whether it was the point that twain was at in his life or just having huck finn as this great character to kind of mitigate things but however he did it i think in this book there there is a there is a, a moral sense that shines through um in a pretty good way especially during that middle section that's much less cynical and much more i mean it's nasty his portraits of all the people of, you know, the antebellum South are nasty, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the Grangerfords are not necessarily nasty, right? Right. You do except feel, for the whole, <laughs> say what? Except for the whole, the uh, whole feud. blood feud thing. Yeah. But you do feel like I found myself, I found that he allowed for there to be real tension in the way that a modern author wouldn't, you know, the entire point of aunt Sally in a modern book would be, that she acts nice, but really when a black person gets killed in a boat accident, she doesn't even consider that. You know, she's just happy that no people died. That would be the entire point. But I found that I actually liked Aunt Sally. You know, she was a little bit more complicated. And the Grangerfords were nice people. And the women that the Duke and the King were taking advantage of, Mary, they were kind. They were worth saving. You know, there were examples of kindness and goodness. And, you know, the Widow Douglas was a little bit more complicated. And even Mrs. Watson, you know, felt bad about wanting to sell Jim up the river. There were these shades of gray that made it more interesting than just everybody's nasty. And this is Mark Twain's vehicle for showing us how we're nasty. It was actually his vehicle for showing us how we're flawed. I would say that the, the, if there's a character outside of Huck that there's real sympathy for, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how how far I'm willing to follow you down the track you just laid, but uh, I do think that there's no question that Mary and those girls, um, that the Duke and the King, are taking advantage of are sympathetic. But if um, I was going to argue the opposite point of view, that Twain is just being nasty to everybody, I think it would be, you could say, those girls are morons. I mean... For falling for it. They fall for it. You yeah. know, the whole town just falls for the idiot Duke and King so easily. But I think I don't want to argue that way. I want to say 
it's always a little bit more complicated all through the book. But you have to imagine that Twain was burned out by his financial failures and then this tension he had in himself about being in the society and also being this boy from this river town and that he became a lot more cynical as he grew older. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we really know of him is like you were saying, the curdled stuff, a lot of his later stuff, he really does just hate everybody. He became an explicit guy. If I remember right, a Connecticut Connecticut and King, whatever. Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's. Everybody is just, who cares? They're just all awful people. Right. Right. And so he just does, he just loses. He has a distaste for humanity later on. Right. It especially comes through in his essays. It is all from Huck's perspective. And Huck, definitely, you have sympathy for him. Mm -hmm. And you know that Twain has sympathy for him. And even a little bit for Tom Sawyer. But also just like another example maybe of what I'm talking about would be that we're allowed to feel sad with Huck when Buck gets shot. I think old Twain might have made even more of a mockery of Buck's death and of what happened there. But the fact that we're allowed to feel the weight of the tragedy there to me makes the book a little bit more complicated than that. And that Mr. Grangerford, he has this Robert E. Lee like dignity in his family. And there really is all the family love him. And it's a happy home for what we can tell. There's yeah. just this. Yeah. I guess, uh, Jake, if you're not willing to follow me down the track of Twain of whatever track I was laying, maybe the track I'm not willing to follow you down is something that you've said a f- number of times over the course of the booking, which is that Twain hates everybody but Huck. I don't think Twain does hate everybody that's not Huck. I think Twain has a complicated love-hate relationship with everybody that's not Huck. And he has some real sympathy for people, and he's very disappointed in people and uh, cynical because of it. You know, I found myself liking some of the other characters. Or it could just be that he created Huck and Huck doesn't hate everybody. That's true. Yeah. Right. And so he likes Huck. That's part of why you like Huck. Yeah. <coughs> because Huck definitely does not hate everybody. Right. So it's the same thing that we'll see with Anna Karenina is um, not to spoil too much. But people realize that when Tolstoy first wrote it, he meant a completely different novel. And then when he started writing it, he sympathized more with Anna than he thought he would. Mm-hmm. And so the novel completely changed. And so you, he thought he would just have this boyhood adventure where all the adults were numbskulls or whatever, and but then it changed, and you had this, what we have now, where Huck, the character, sympathizes with everyone. Right. Right. Whether or not Twain does, who knows. Today's episode of The Booking was written and produced by me, Nathan Alberson. It was performed by Nathan Alberson, Brandon Chastine, and Jacob Mensel. You can go to warhornmedia.com for lots more amazing content, including ordering Tim Bailey's new book, Daddy Tried. A really good book. Not as good as Huckleberry Finn, but if you want to learn how to be a Christian father, probably more useful. If you enjoyed this podcast, go on iTunes and leave us a nice rating or review. That's really helpful, and we would thank you very much for doing that. <laughs>